and we will share, share the screen so you can see the show, Zoomers. How about that? Of course, I spoke too soon. There's one more. So I made some changes this morning that I think you, you folks are going to like. You want to see? Mm -hmm. So I realized that um, lecture four and example four, there's no way in hell that's getting finished today since I have like 35 slides left or something. And if I don't finish that lecture today, that means that you can't do homework two when I had originally assigned it. So I pushed it back a week. So I'm grading your homework ones this week. You have formative assessment number two to finish by Monday. That's about identification and stuff like that that we've already talked about. And then the following Monday, there's nothing due anymore. So October 3rd, you get a week off. Homework two has been pushed one week back so that we'll have enough time to finish example four and lecture four that you will need to be able to do it. So homework two will be a canned data assignment where you get to practice using M plus or Levon to run CFA models and answer the questions. And then I pushed, uh, after my conference was over, I had nothing due, but I pushed formative assessment number three and an optional revision to after that. So just as a reminder, uh, Tuesday, let's see, no, Wednesday, the 12th of October, and then that Thursday and Friday, I'm going to be running a conference and not responding to email or being here. So I didn't want to have anything serious due while I was gone because that's a recipe for disaster. But formative assessments and revisions to homework, I think everyone can handle in my absence, right? And you have some material to review on your own regarding EFA uh, from a previous version of this class, as well as an additional set of lectures that Jonathan gave a few years ago, where he goes into the math of why EFA is terrible in more detail than I did. So I put those all um, available for you to look at on your own during that week instead of coming here. So to recap... Formative assessment due Monday, nothing due the following week, and then homework too. That way we have enough time to get through everything without rushing through the important parts. Uh, speaking of rushing through the important parts, what we talked about last time with respect to model fit stuff, I went over quickly because I have a better source for you than me. So this is my plug for the reading list. There are tons of readings on the reading list, and I try to emphasize the ones that matter more. There are three chapters by Craig Enders from his Missing Data book, chapters 3, 4, and 5, that are on your list for this week. He does an infinitely better job of explaining maximum likelihood and the use of first and second derivatives to help maximize the functions than I can. It's very readable, it's very practical, and so I would encourage you to take the time to read through those chapters to understand his explanations of how these things work um, like I said, very readable, very useful. And he also talks about missing data and what missing at random means. And one of his examples is actually a CFA model directly. So it is directly relevant in addition to just understanding the use of likelihood functions which occur across all different types of statistics. So just a plug for, for those additional sources for you. Okay, any questions on schedule, readings, other stuff? I pushed the next unit back one day, and I'm thinking it may need to be two days, but we'll see how far we get today. Cool? Cool. Are we here? We're ready to party? We're, we're here-ish. You are physically present. That much I can, I can tell, because I can see you, and I can hear you. Let's party. Thank you. That's what I say. We shall party. So uh, I want to remember Tuesday's party first, though, if that's all right, because you, you can't just walk into the party cold, right? You got to get revved up. So we were talking about uh, the start of assessing fit. So the idea of model fit, broadly construed, is how well does the factor model that we have chosen recreate the observed data means, variances, and covariances for our indicators. Where matching well is a good thing. That's fit. Misfit is not matching well. So that basic idea gets operationalized in a variety of what are known as fit statistics, and some of them are relative to the best possible model as a reference, and some of them are relative to the worst possible model. So we started talking about this last time, right? Does this look familiar? Maybe? We talked about this last time, maybe? 
Do we need to talk about it again? Zoomers, what do you think? Everyone's looking at their laptops. <laughs> I would love to re-go over it. You would, you would love to re-go over it. Then I shall. Yeah, See, that's I all it takes. Same? Re-go over? Yeah. Quick yeah. Quick okay. Yes. Yeah, it's not just review. Because review, like, implies, like, a shortening. Re-go over <laughs> means, like, pretend like you never, ever said it the first time and do it again. But, yeah, that's cool. I'm totally fine with that. I, I, uh, I appreciate direct requests. So slide 47, let's re-go over it. So baseline models that are involved in assessing model fit. The right side here is our friend, what's known as the saturated model. Uh, those of you who've taken any multi-level modeling will recognize this as an unstructured matrix. That is the same idea with different words. The saturated model says, you know what, I'm not going to try to predict or recreate or pattern anything. I'm just going to let the data be what it wants. So I'm just going to estimate all the indicator means, indicator slash item are synonyms, by the way. Indicator is what it tends to be called in the context of CFA. I'm going to estimate all the item variances and all the item covariances, and I'm going to see how tall the data can possibly be. Tall is known as what, by the way? Yeah, log likelihood in particular, because likelihood gets ugly real quick. So log likelihood is the total height of the data, and the saturated model here is the, the best possible thing you can have. That is the right answer. So it's our baseline against how well we can match it. This is known as the H1 model, and you will get the log likelihood for this H1 model as part of your output. The worst possible model is over on the left here. This is independence or null model, and it's actually not the worst. So if you're using these models to do growth curve analyses, we would need a different version of this because this already has stuff in it. It has separate variances for each item. It has separate means for each item, but it has no covariances. So this model says, you know what? All you got is just a bunch of items that have nothing to do with each other. Prove me wrong. Our model, hopefully, does better than the independence model and hopefully does as well as the saturated model. But it can't ever do better. So the way that we talk about fit is not worse. Is our model not worse than the best model? That's our global test of fit. And then there will be additional indices that are relative to the worst model. How much better is our model than the worst model? And those are two different pieces of information, which is why sometimes your model will look good according to some indices and not by others. Is this sounding familiar? Like, like, yep. yep. Like, I feel like I've heard this before, but... <clears throat> it is. Yeah, that's the thing. You know, if I had a dollar for every time I was sitting in a stats class or a workshop and I thought, you know, if they could just say that one more time, I would have had it, right? That's the key is that it takes a lot of times and it takes a lot of times said a little bit differently each time to kind of co create like a rounded version of, of what the story is. So likelihood ratio tests are going to be the way that we decide whether a given model is better or worse than an alternative model. We're taking the log likelihood height statistic and we're going to compare it to another model. Two of those comparisons are done for you on your output, whether you like it or not, but usually it's a useful thing. One of them is labeled as a test of model fit, which is your model versus the saturated model. And your model is called what in parlance of M plus and Levon? If it's not the H1, what are you? We're the hoe. So I thought you'd remember that part. Yes, thank you, Lindsay. We are all the hoe. She was one of the uh, gluttons for punishment at Nebraska who simultaneously did the JD law program and the PhD psych program and was in school for a very long time but has a lot of letters behind her name to show for it. So a happy ending to that story. So the hoe value. This is the height of your model. And this test statistic right here in the blue box 
this is m plus output, is the difference in log likelihood height relative to the perfect model. And the test itself has not just the difference between these two log likelihoods, but also these scaling correction factors into it. So I'll show you that formula in just a bit. But the idea is what this blue box is telling us is how much worse than perfect our factor model is. Where perfect is the H1 model. If we are correct about the hypothesized factor structure, like if my six forgiveness items really measure one thing, then the pattern of variance and covariance that that single factor model predicts should be bang on to what the actual data want. And to the extent that I'm wrong, they won't match. The pink one, and I have on here, ignore. The pink one here, the test of the baseline model, this has nothing to do with what you put in the program. It is how much worse the null model is from the best model. All it's telling us is that there is covariance in the data to be modeled. That's it. And if it wasn't, we would have already seen that before because the first thing what we would do is have a correlation matrix. Okay, Levon version of it, same blue and pink here, but in slightly different places. So Levon output has two flavors of it given, the regular flavor maximum likelihood and the robust version, where robust has a correction applied to account for multivariate non-normality, where if it's actually perfectly normal, that scaling factor thing is going to be 1. To the extent that it's greater than 1, that means it's more flat. Flatty kurtosis, is that the right word? That, that sounds right? I never remember which is which, but I know that like platy sounds like flatty, and so that's the one that's like, you know, squishier down, more like a T than a normal or whatever. Anyway, how far off from normal is, is used to correct the test statistics as well as the standard errors? That's chapter five of the Ender's Missing Data book. So the test that we care about is given front and center. That's the 307 here. That's how much worse our single factor model is for these six forgiveness items. That's where these data came from. And here's the one we don't care about in pink. And here are the log likelihood values and their scaling factors that went into that computation. And I think that's about as far as we got, give or take. There, re-gone over. Questions? Diet Cherry 7-Up today. Continuing to switch it up amongst my off-brand soda choices that are in our fridge right now. No caffeine. This is just straight me. Minus the three cups of coffee and Mountain Dew I had at lunch. But otherwise, straight me. Question? Yes. Uh, the scaling factor yeah. stuff. You said you're going to get into it. Yep. Is there like a number? How soon is it coming? Let me find if I can find the slide. Keep talking. I was just curious if there's like a no, threshold of like, see. if it's above five, we should be Nope. Nope. Okay. That doesn't work that way. Cool. One means perfectly multivariate normal, in which case everything would simplify to just regular flavor ML that you would get in this first column. So because it simplifies to that, to me, there's no reason not to do it. Um, the only catch is that you have to have a software program that prints these scaling factors for you to use them in likelihood ratio tests. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... Um, there is a way to ask for like robust stuff in other packages, like Stata has robust standard errors, SAS does that, but then it doesn't give you scaling factors by which to compare models. And so then it's like, the question is like, what, are you, what exactly are you robusting? Is it just the fixed effects or is it like the whole model? And so that's why it only shows up in this class because they have the scaling factors that can be used to, to still yield the correct tests. Okay? Yep. Okay. Other questions? So there's the, the sort of the big picture. Now we get into some of the, the, the nitty-gritty, so to speak. So four steps in assessing fit. We'll go over these one by one. Global fit. How well does the model match the right answer, saturated model as a whole? Local fit, which is how we figure out why it doesn't match. We make sure that all the parameters that we got back are reasonable. And then we have the question of reliability and information. How useful is this factor model? Not just does it fit, but how good are these items? 
because items that don't measure a factor well can still yield a very well-fitting model. So effect size versus fit are completely different things. It's easy to get it confused. So one by one, we'll walk through this stuff. So first up, the primary index of fit is that chi-square that compares the saturated model to your model. How much worse than perfect is your model is distributed as a chi-square where significance is bad because it's worse than perfect. It is a likelihood ratio test rescaled by those scaling factors for the non-normality. Uh, you will see ratio rules sometimes show up in publications. Don't do that. It's not a thing anymore. Uh, like, well, my chi-square divided by degrees of freedom is, is not as bad as three, so I think that means it's cool. No, not, no, no more. None of that. Um, this idea, though, that we're comparing against the perfect model has a lot of challenges to it. Number one is perfect? Really? Like, that's our goal? What happened to good enough, right? No. The other is the idea that this is a significance test. And how does large versus small samples factor into that? So normally when someone asks me, how many people do you need in your study? What's my answer? More, More right? Well, what if you have like a data set with 20,000 cases? A few of you have very large data sets that work with this. You got plenty. You have the opposite problem because you have a ton of power for this significance test to detect differences from perfect. So you can be like perfect to four decimal places and that's not good enough because you have 20,000 people by which to evaluate this. Conversely, if you only have like 80 people and you're trying to fit these models, everything's gonna be fit because you have no power to detect misfit. So just using this is usually insufficient. In practice, I would say in most cases, a non-significant chi-square is not a thing. Like, it only in very few cases have I actually seen that happen. And it usually involves fake data <laughs> and very few degrees of freedom. So because of that, people augment this sort of binary thumbs up, thumbs down description of model fit with other indices that are continuous. So there's absolute fit indices, which are relative to the best model. And then there are what's known as comparative, which are relative to the worst. And it used to be that there were cut and dry, like this means good and this means bad. But within the last 15 years or so, there's been a whole lot of research that questions that sort of black and white distinction as to what is good enough. So that's one of the things that um, I want to highlight here. And also on your reading list, there's a chapter by uh, Steve West and his colleagues in a forthcoming handbook of SEM. Um, that's on your reading list for this unit as well, and they summarize all of this literature in terms of how, how fit assessment has changed and what you can do now to get yourself a more customized assessment for your data set. So that, that is on there, another one I want to highlight. So here's one. This one is called SRMR, and that stands for Standardized Root Mean Square Residual. And pro tip, any of these fit indices that have the word error or residual in them, that means you want them to be little numbers, small error, less residual. This one has a little bit of an ugly formula, but it boils down to something that's pretty straightforward. If I have my correlation matrix that's from the H1 answer, answer key saturated model, and I've got the one that my model predicts, you can literally find how far off each correlation is and this is the average offness of those correlations. How far off on average is the model predicted correlation from the data observed correlation? And 0.08-ish is considered acceptable, and you want it to be as small as possible. There's also an unstandardized version of this, but that one tends to be used less common because it's based on covariances, which makes it harder to figure out what a good number would be because it's scale dependent. So that's one that we'll look at. Here is one that is universally used, RMSEA, root mean square error of approximation. Again, error as part of the title. We want it to be small. This one has a parsimony correction to it. It's essentially how far off you are per degree of freedom left over. So RMSEA does not like complicated models. It likes simple models. So adding stuff to make your model fit better 
might help make your data taller. I might change the log likelihood, but it may not help the RMSEA. This one has the most adjectives used to describe numbers. So less than 0.05 or 6, depending on where you're reading, is considered good. 0.05 to 0.08 is adequate. Other people use words like borderline or marginal. Uh, the words don't actually help. Just tell your reader what the number is, and they can put their own verbal label on it as they wish. This one is useful because you can also get a confidence interval for it. And the confidence interval, just like any confidence interval, will be wider to the extent that you have less data. There's more uncertainty into what it would be. So people typically report the point estimate and the confidence interval. And there's one more thing, cough, cough, uh, upcoming homework question. There's a p-value that shows up with this thing. And it's based on the idea that perfect is an unreasonable standard. How about close? Close enough. So there is a p-value that will show up as to whether your RMSEA is less than 0.05, not 0, which would be perfect, but 0.05 meaning good enough. And that is called the test of close fit, not exact fit. I did not make up these words. That's what they're called. So that one has three parts, point estimate, confidence interval, and then a p-value as to whether or not you're close enough. Where close enough is 0.05. So both SRMR and RMSEA are relative to perfect. These ones, comparative fit, and they have the word fit in the title, means you want them to be big. We have CFI and also TLI, which in some software is called NNFI for non-norm fit index, these ones are relative to the null model. So this is telling us, relative to the worst model, how much better are we? And so the, we want to be as best as possible, which is 1 in CFI, and it can go over 1 in CLI because they don't have a bound on it. So that one, I think, is less useful. CFI tends to be used quite a bit. So how much better than terrible is your model? That's what CFI tells you. So we have then all of these choices to go with. Then the question is, what about these different conventions as to what is considered good and not? And where do they come from? Well, most of them came from one article published in 1999 that's been cited almost 100,000 times. One simulation study that was, at the time, very comprehensive, and these, based on their results, they decided what was good. Like CFI of 0.95, good. 0.9, uh, acceptable, but not good. RMSEA of 0.08, acceptable. RMSEA 0.05, good. Like these numbers, right? And the entire world just like was like, cool, thank you for telling us what good is. And I'm going to use that standard in my research. The problem is that no one study can cover every situation. And so people have started to poke holes as to, well, well maybe good should be contextual based on everything else that's happening in your model and your data. So in their simulation, all of the indicators that they simulated had good relations to their factors. So standardized loadings around 0.7 to 0.8. So at least half of the indicator's variance is thought to be caused by the factor. They had a small-ish model where they only had three factors, five indicators each, so only 15 variables in total. They had complete data, and everything was perfectly multivariate normal. So now people have been like, well, what if these things are not the case? How do our conclusions change? And they do quite a bit. So I have some particular studies um, on these slides that I have linked to the pages where you can find out more about them. A summary of all of that that was written in the handbook chapter, West et al. is on your reading list. So here's one. How about missing data? Now, is missing data typically a good thing or a bad thing? Both. Typically bad, right? Because you'd like to have more data and more people. And if people don't answer certain questions, there's probably a reason, right? And that reason may be related to what they would have said. Well, it turns out that in terms of fit, 
missing data is actually helpful. Because if you don't have some of the data, it gets harder to say it doesn't fit. So here's an article that demonstrates this. On the left-hand side, what we're looking at is RMSEA. So the y-axis tops out at 0.15, which everyone would agree is terrible. And it goes all the way down to zero, which is as good as it can be. And what's on the x-axis is essentially how much wrong you are, degree of misfit. So you would expect that you see these curves go up as misfit increases. Well, that is what happens. But then the different colored lines here in the bottom indicate percent missingness. So for the case where the indicators have 50% missing data, RMSEA does not reflect the bad fit as much as people as if you had complete data. You're missing the information that it's based on. The same thing happens if you look at it in terms of correlated residuals uh, with CFI. So now the y-axis on the right-hand side is confirmatory, or no, comparative fit index, where 1 is the best that you can have, and it goes all the way down to 0.7. And again, there's less of a decline if you have missing data. So missing data actually helps your model look like it fits better because you don't have all the information you would need to say that it doesn't. Uh, same thing happens if you're not just talking about misfit due to correlated residuals, so the idea that there's extra correlation. This is where if you get your factor model wrong, same thing happens. Uh, good fit by the number of indicators. This one is fairly complex. So this is from a different paper where they found that basically if you have a ton of variables in your model, good luck getting decent fit. It just gets a lot harder. Um, it's different with respect to CFI versus RMSEA, but it's the same pattern in that the when you should have watched your fit statistics get worse as you messed with the model and made it more wrong, the more variables you have, that, that screws up that process. So like these pictures down here, it looks like RMSEA in some of these cases, depending on how, uh, these are different types of misspecifications, the more how do I say this? The more indicators that you have, the easier it is. It looks like that there's, uh, it, it's easier to make RMSEA happy. So like if you have one factor with three indicators, RMSEA is not going to be as happy as if you had, well, make, make it four because then it's testable, sorry, as if you had 20 because RMSEA likes parsimony. So number of indicators is another thing that can cause like your fit indices to not work according to those conventions. Another one is the factor loadings. If you have a really, really strong signal, if you have indicators that are highly related to the factor that they're supposed to measure, it's easier to tell when you go wrong. But if you have a pile of correlation that's mediocre, like correlations in the 0.2s, 0.3s, then it's much harder to tell when you're wrong because there's not much there to begin with. So this is yet another study looking at uh, how RMSEA and CFI and R SRMR uh, function as a, as, a, as a function of factor loadings. And so, like, this last case here is pretty striking. This is the distribution of CFI across repeated samples for a case where they have factor loadings in the 0.9s. This is 0.7, and this is 0.4. So this is all supposed to be the same model in terms of its misfit. But you could get anywhere from a CFI of 0.75 up to 1 if your factor loadings are really weak. So it can be easier to look like you have a good model if you don't have a strong signal to detect in the correlation matrix. And one more. This one shows mathematically the situations in which CFI will be happy but RMSEA will not versus where they'll both be happy versus where RMSEA will be happy but CFI will not. And it's a complex function of misfit amount and model size. But there is this relationship that they found where any models in this territory will look like CFI likes it, and in this territory it will look like RMSEA likes it, but CFI doesn't. So here's the article that I'm saying, or actually it's a book chapter. Read this to summarize all of these different things. Uh, there is a newer approach that's being advocated that I don't have in the slides here based on simulation. 
So that's something that I wouldn't expect your average CFA user to go to the trouble to do, but they're building a shiny app to make it easier and stuff like that. So that's uh, McNeish et al. Within that West article, there's a section that talks about that too. So point of the story. It used to be, be like, if it's less than 0.05, that's good, but not always. And I don't know that reviewers understand these nuances, but if you are in a situation where it looks like your model does not fit and you're like out of ideas, you might consider like, are you in the space where you just have too many indicators or too much or too little missing data, I guess, or too high a factor loadings, like what would be a reasonable solution? And simulation could be used to address each specific case versus trying to use rules that may not necessarily fit all. So point of the story, we have these indices, we have conventions about what good is, but they are no longer hard and fast rules. That's the point of the story. There's always nuance. Always room for opinion. Okay. Um, I have a question. Hit me. Because we have so many indices of fit, yeah. what do you normally report in publication? Uh, I do CFI and RMSEA for sure. And then it depends. Mm -hmm. Yep, it, exactly. Because those tend to be the, the most well researched and the most common, but there's others. And like, so I looked on the Levon output, and there's like four other ones that I hadn't even heard of because people have done more work and made up new ones. And, I, and they're like the robust version of something. And I'm not sure what goes into that, but there's, it's, there's a lot. Yeah, so CFI and RMSEA, and then the, the chi square tested model fit usually. Yeah. Those would be the minimum ones. So let me show you then in our working example with the forgiveness data. So this is the same example for that we've been playing with. This is page seven. And I have six items that are supposed to measure one thing. What we saw so far is that each item does have a significant loading, but it looks like the reverse coded items do a little bit better than the others. But up to this point, we haven't looked at fit. So now we can do that. So first thing we need to know, is our model identified in terms of the number of pieces of information that we're trying to estimate, parameters, versus data going in? So the formula for degrees of freedom is right here. Number of indicators times number of indicators plus 1 divided by 2. That part gives you the total number of variances and covariances in the matrix. Plus the number of indicators again is the number of means. So for our model, we have six indicators. That means we have 27 pieces of information with which to estimate this model. 27 is because six means and then the rest are variances and covariances. How many did we spend? 18. Where did I come up with 18? We'll count them up. How many indicators do I have? Six. Six. So how many intercepts did I estimate then? Six. Six. How many error variances did I estimate? Six. Six. And if it's a single factor model, how many loadings did I estimate? Six. Six. Duh, that's 18. Yep. Now what if I had done the alternate version of identification where I estimated a factor variance and fixed one of the loadings to one? Does that change my count? No, because then I'd have five loadings and one variance. Yeah. So the only thing that changes the count is when you add factors, because then you're adding covariances between them as extra parameters. Otherwise, number of indicators times three is a good rubric that you can think of in terms of degrees of freedom. So I spent 18. I got nine left. Where the discrepancy comes in is that my six loadings are trying to recreate I think is it 15 covariances? Does that sound right? Yes, that's right. Because it's V times V minus 1 in that case. Yeah. So my six loadings are trying to recreate 15 covariances. That's where the nines comes from. So here is my M plus output first. And this is me being nice, by the way. M plus does not label this shit for you. If it did, I wouldn't have a job. It's like, here's your hoe, good luck. So here's how tall my model is. Here's the scaling factor for how far off from normal my data are. 
H1, this is the best possible height my data can have if I were to just estimate everything separately and the scaling factor that goes with that. Here's my information criteria, which are scaled the opposite way. Smaller is better for these. They can be used for non-nested model comparisons or for nested model comparisons. The formula for them is over here. It is the same formula that we use in multi-level models and in other types of models that are based on likelihood estimation. Then we get to chi-square test of fit. So this is the value that was in the slides, the 308. So this is bad news. My model is significantly worse than perfect. And M plus tries to help you. Hey, you, you can't do likelihood ratio tests the usual way. You have to do it a special way. And it's described on the M plus website. Where? Somewhere. <laughs> I have it in the slides, though. I found it. There is a page for that. Here's the formula, though. So we have the change in height is the log likelihood from the model that has fewer parameters minus the log likelihood from the model that has more. So this is HO minus H1 in this case. Yours has fewer because there's six loadings that are trying to do 15 covariances. Then we multiply the difference in log likelihoods by minus two, and that number is the 427. Then we do the scaling correction. So it's number of parameters in the model that has fewer times that scale factor minus the number of parameters in the model that has more times that scale factor divided by the difference in the number of parameters. So that works out to be this thing. And then we take the minus two log likelihood difference and divide by the scaling correction factor. And I think I have a typo there. I think there's a three missing. That looks better. And then that works out to be the, the chi-square test. So if you are using M+, you do have to do likelihood ratio tests of any model that, of yours relative to another choice yourself. But this one comparing against the saturated model will always be done for you. Uh, question, if you have a model where there are three indicators per factor, will M plus still give HO and H1? Why, yes, it will. So if I only have three indicators per factor, then how many degrees of freedom left over would I have? Zero. Zero. So that means... What would happen with respect to those values for HO and H1 log likelihood? Would be the same? They'll be the same. Yeah, it's perfect. It has to be because I estimated three loadings and I've got three covariances. Boom, boom. Perfect. So that seems like it would be a good thing, but it's actually not because then that doesn't allow us to make a statement as to whether those three items do measure one thing. They have to. There is no other option mathematically unless you put constraints in to save loadings. So this process generalizes to any kind of model comparison. Like if I said, what if I had two factors? Does that make it better? I'd have to do this myself. But anything relative to saturated is done for you. Okay. Question so far? So then RMSEA, what do you think? Here is the estimate 0.173. Do we want this to be big or small? And feel free to read from the screen. <laughs> yes, I am shameless in encouraging audience participation. I will put the answers in the slides. Yes, smaller is better. So what is the smallest that it can be? Zero, yes, because if it's perfect, then it matches the saturated model exactly, and it's zero. So ours is 0.17. What do I call that? Good or not so good? Not good. This is not good. <laughs> this is the one where 0.05 means close. Yeah, go ahead. Wait. Zoomers, I heard someone. Who was it? Who did I hear? I said, I said it was not good. good. Yes, you are, you are correct. Yes, not good. 0.05-ish, up to 0.08 maybe, but definitely 0.17 is not good. Here's the confidence interval around it. This will get wider the fewer people you have. 
makes sense. This is my test of close fit. No, 0.17 is not less than 0.05. Decidedly not. So no, this is not good enough according to relative to the saturated model that's perfect. How about, how much better did we do than the worst possible model? That's these two. CFI and TLI. In this case, bigger is better. The best that CFI can be is 1. Ours is 0.7 something. Yeah, not good enough. Nowhere near. 0.9 is where you want to be. 0.95 maybe. SRMR. So this one is relative to saturated. What is the average offness of the model predicted correlation? And we're only off by like 0.08. That one's like, this looks fine to me. What's your guys' problem? And yes, I'm anthropomorphizing the fit statistics. I am. And this one, do I care about this? I do not. Who cares? This one is telling me that the best model is better than the worst model. Yeah, I know. Has nothing to do with my model, though. And then here's the likelihood ratio test for how, where this number came from. You'd have to know what the log likelihood is for the null model. Here's the same information in Levon, just in a different order, with some extra stuff thrown in. So keep in mind the first column is regular flavor ML, assuming perfect normality. We are looking at the second column, which is the robust version invoked by MLR. So the first is our test statistic for how much worse than perfect we are. Still bad. Here's the, the scaling correction factor. Here is the who cares model tested the baseline model. Then we get into the other fit statistics, CFI, TLI. So the 0.7 and the 0.5 for those are what we got an M plus. I don't know what these are. There's some other new version that presumably the same rules would apply, but I hadn't seen them yet. Uh, here are the log likelihoods themselves, so HO and H1. I want to point something out. Do you see anything uh, similar about those two numbers? Yeah. Yeah. Sort of. <laughs> sort of, a little bit. Okay, how about those two numbers? Yeah, they're the same. Height don't care because we're calculating height of the data given the model using the formula for multivariate normal as our ruler for height. So the log likelihood itself doesn't change as a function of estimation. It's the conclusions that we draw about it via these scaling factors that are used to adjust the tests of their differences. So these two will, these will always be the same regardless of your estimator. And then we get the smaller is better version of these things down here. Then the next page has RMSEA, which I do want to point this out. This was interesting to me. It doesn't always work like this, but RMSEA is still terrible, but it's smaller in the robust version than the original. So sometimes it, your fit could look worse if you are assuming you have perfect normality and you don't. And the opposite could be true, I think, in other cases as well. I'm sorry, say that one more time. Yep. Your fit could look worse if the assumptions aren't being met. Okay. It could also look better. It just depends on which way it goes. But the fact that you might come to a different conclusion, I think, is, is the point here. If, you, if these numbers are different, I would trust the robust version. And then here's another version of RMSEA that I don't know what, how it's different than this one, but it is. It's not happy. And then the last is standardized root mean square residual. Uh, just for demonstration purposes, oh no, I have a question first, hang on. I'm not sure it's super important, but what is likelihood measured in? It is the, sort of like the probability of a continuous distribution value for any one value. So it actually would be a tiny, tiny number. And that's why if we take the log, then it becomes negative. So these numbers are usually negative because they're in logs. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. so is it the, like, like if we're talking about normal distribution, is it the area under the curve at the point of the z-score? Uh, it, 
It's like it would be the height of the curve at that point, but since oh, you yeah. can't have it like exactly at a point if it's continuous. It's so basically um, summation of the area under the curve is to probability as integration is to likelihood. That's okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you. But you do bring up a point. Like, there's no way that I could look at this number and come to any kind of conclusion about it. Uh, this is the height. I don't know if that's good or not until I compare it to something else. So these numbers don't have any absolute meaning that you, would, you should know about. Uh, bigger is better, which in this case would mean less negative. And for AIC and BIC, smaller is better because they're multiplied by minus 2. Okay. Just for demonstration purposes, meaning you don't need to do this in your life, I just wanted to show you. This is what it would look like if you tried to fit the saturated model. And this is what I did, I believe, in the video for M plus that I used. So I would just ask for the means to be estimated for each item, ask for the variance to be estimated, and ask for all the covariances to be estimated. Uh, this is a shortcut that you can do in M plus that I couldn't make work in Levon. So if you list a series of variables, the word with, and then the same series of variables, that does all possible combinations. So you don't have to list out all 15. Unless you're using Levon, in which case I had to. Not to say that it isn't possible, but that I couldn't make it work and I gave up. And at some point, writing it out is just faster than continuing to ask the Google, how do I do this in R? So then we fit the saturated model to illustrate what would happen. Number of free parameters is 27. Means free to not be zero. Like estimated is what that means. And the HO model height in log likelihoods is equivalent to the H1 model. Coincidence or consequence? What do you think? Consequence. If I fit the saturated model, if I did it correctly, it should be just as tall as the saturated model. Remember, you are the hoe. H1 is the saturated model. So I'm fitting the saturated model to show you what it looks like. And also, anytime you spend all of your degrees of freedom, your chi-square should be zero with no degrees of freedom left. Here is what I get back. This is the data. These are the variances and covariances of my items as estimated using maximum likelihood, by the way. So this is the divide by n version, not the divide by n minus 1 version. In Levon, you can actually ask for the n minus 1 version. I don't know how to do that in M plus, though. But this is Levon output that's right here from a function called fitted, which returns what the model says the covariance matrix should look like. And here's the six means as well. Also, here's the null model. So this is the worst model. I'm asking for all the means, I'm asking for all the variances, but then I shut off all the covariances. The way to do that in M plus is via the at zero for every item after the with. So shut them all off and just to not write them in Levon. So the null model then has only 12 parameters because it's six means and six variances. Here is what the null model says the data look like, no covariance at all. And now the minus 2 log likelihood rescaled difference test between the HO for the null model and saturated will match what it is down here. So this is also instructive, I think, for RMSEA. This is as bad as it could possibly be. So for our data, if we said there's no factor here, there's no covariances at all, RMSEA is 0.26. So that's like an upper bound as to what is possible for our data set. Our model's RMSEA was like 0.17, so not very good. And CFI and TLI are zero because this is the null model that they're based against. So our model is the worst possible model at this point. Okay, 251, we're doing good. Is there any, like, yes. comparison of the RMSEA to basically like the null model value against what we would get? Not that I know of, but I could see that that could be useful. Like, like what proportion have you gotten to kind of thing? Like, like, but this is the worst that it would be. 
is because this is a model that says there is no factor here. There's no loadings, there's no nothing. Yeah. And that may very well be what the robust versions are doing or something. I haven't had a chance to look into them. So, Got it. Thank you. yep, sure. Good instinct, though. I like it. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the next piece, when fin and disease disagree. Okay, questions so far? So what we have just learned is that our six items do not appear to measure one thing. Because the predictions from the model that say they measure one thing do not match what the data say in terms of the, the covariances specifically. It's the item means and variances will be okay. It's the covariances that are the problem. So do we just pack up and go home? Like, yep, it doesn't fit. Sorry, NIH. I know you gave me $5 million to do this, but it doesn't fit. Sorry. It's confirmatory. I can't fix it because then I'm not confirming anymore. Some people would say that. I am not one of those people. I live in a world in which you got to make it work sometimes. So in most cases, when it doesn't fit on the first try, which is what's going to happen for most of you, I've only seen it happen a few times where someone was actually right and the data believed them. When it doesn't fit, or even if it does, we still go on to step two. And step two is to be the detective to figure out where you went wrong. So there's an analogy I like to use for this based on grade point average. If, let's say that uh, Huey goes to Montessori school, so they don't have grades or tests or things yet, but at some point he's going to be in the world of grade point averages. And let's say that he comes home with his report card and it's a 3.0. I don't plan on being like the tiger mom, like person who needs him to be perfect. I don't plan on that, but 3.0 has some room for improvement. So what do I do? Well, the first question is, how did he get the 3.0? Because if it's four Bs, he might need to just do a little bit more in each of the classes versus like three A's and an F, which would also be a 3.0. And that would require a very different solution as to how he would improve his grade point average. And then I would have to know, like, is it the F in something important like math or is it like art and crafts? Because he hates art, arts and crafts and so do I. So I'd be like, you go ahead and fail that, buddy. I don't care. But math, math he needs to care. I know. Or PE. He can fail PE for all I care as well. You don't want to play kickball today? Fine. You go read your book. That's what I used to do. So this idea, like 3.0, right? That would be like a global model fit. Like it's not good enough yet, but how do we fix it? We got to know where the problems are. So in the same vein, we got to dig into the predictions and figure out where we are off and in what way. So we're going to look at local misfit or mo model strain, as it is sometimes called, which is sort of a funny term, but that is like the Brown book uses that term. And it's based on the idea of residuals, but not to be confused with residuals that are the E's at the end of the model equation. The use of the word residual in this context means discrepancy, offness. So we're going to go into each element of the means, variances, and covariances and see how far off it is. And there are scaled versions of that, so we can get the offnesses and covariance. There's a correlation version, so we can get the offnesses and correlation. That's usually more helpful. And then there's also a sort of a test statistic-like thing that's called a normalized residual. And this is offness divided by the standard error of the observed value. So it's kind of like a z-score. So relatively bigger values indicate more of a problem. Positive residuals means that the items are more related than you predicted. So items want to be more together than what the factor model says if the residual correlation, the offness, is a positive value. If it's a negative value, they don't want to be together. Positive values are a lot easier to fix than negative, though. So let's see what happens in our example. I'm on page 12. So first step here, I'm asking, and this is our output because it's a lot more compact, what does the model say the covariance matrix should look like given a single factor? Okay, that's right here. That's what my model says. 
Now we went over where those numbers got built from last time, but would that be helpful to, to read to re go over it or at least review it? Maybe. I think the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> Okay. I'm not sure is related to this or not. I can tell you the answer. Getting this output is like you specify at the very beginning, right? Where it's like, okay, cool. So in so in M plus, you add the word residual to the output, and a whole bunch of crap falls out. And then you just have to use like Control F to find where it is. This is the fitted option that spit this out in R specifically. Yep. So the diagonal. What are these? Conceptually, what are they? They're variances. They're total variances. Now, how do they get built? How much of it is factor and how much of it is not the factor? So factor is loading squared times variance of the factor. Our variance of the factor is 1 here, so it's just loading squared, plus however much is called error variance. And so that's why as long as each item has its own error variance, it will perfectly recreate the variances. Because whatever is not the factor, it's like, well, you got three left over. How about I make your variance three? And then it's perfect. So the error variance just plugs the hole of however much needs to be there to get back to the total. So and I'm sure you just said this. <laughs> uh, it's because we estimated yes. the residual it's because. stuff in our model. Yep. Okay. Yep, as long as each item gets its own error variance, you will get back to the right total in these models. Because whatever's not the factor, that's just what it becomes. And so if we look at this diagonal, this is model predicted on the left versus original data saturated, spot on. Has to be. Six variances going in, six error variances coming back. Spot on. Likewise, so long as each item has its own intercept, perfectly recreates the item means, spot on. And that is as it should be because we're just trading, right? It's six and six for each of these. Where the problem comes in is the 15 covariances that the six loadings are responsible for recreating. So like this one right here, the model says that is loading of item one times factor variance, which is one, times loading of item two. Likewise, this covariance down here between one and six is loading of item one times factor variance times loading of item six. So allowing different loadings allows us to have some items be better than others. Like we're not assuming they're all equally good. Each one gets its own loading. But we are assuming that the only reason the items have a covariance is because they measure the same factor. And so therefore, the loadings dictate the covariance. And we can eyeball these. Like this one was predicted to be 0.8, but it's actually 0.5. This one was predicted to be 1.5, but it's actually 1.8. And wouldn't it be nice if someone would like just like subtract these matrices so we didn't have to do it ourselves? Wouldn't that be nice? Plus does for us. Yeah, they both do. Yeah. So the resid function, as well, and it's in M plus, it's called like residuals for covariances, that section. I've got some M plus output coming up here in just a, a few pages. Disrepnancies. Let's see here. Double check that this is correct. I'm pretty sure it's not. Discrepancies. Nope, closer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Discrepancies, close enough. Offnesses, do you like that better word? Offnesses. So here are my offnesses. So the diagonal, perfect zeros, variances are fine. Mean offnesses, fine. Where the problem is, is in the covariance pattern here. So these are in the unit of covariance, which is sort of hard to figure out what a lot is. So let's standardize that and talk about offnesses in terms of correlations right below it. So the relationship between items one and two was underpredicted. The relationship are actually overpredicted because they want to be less together. 
Positive values mean that the items are more related in the data. Negative values mean that they're less related in the data. Yes, this is what it is. I knew I had it in here. So M plus calls that same matrix residuals for correlations. Offnesses. So this is the same information in both packages. M plus just has it take up more space. Then there's one more that we can look at, which is the normalized version. And in R, we ask for that with another call to resid with the type equals normalized, rather than type equals raw, which is covariance, or core, which is correlation. And these are like z-scores. So relatively large values should be cause for concern. And I've highlighted the ones that looked like they were the biggest, these three right here. You see anything in common as to why that set of three items all want to be more together than what the factor model says? Items two, four, and six. Not the R's. Yeah, they're not the R's. So the model is like, no, 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 no. It, it sort of matters which way you ask the question. Those want to be more together than what the factor says. So conceptually, they have something else in common that's not situation forgiveness. Items one and two is another one that's a negative one. They don't want to be together. The model says they're more related than what the data say. And I have a question here. Why do you think the positive ones have this pattern to them that is not present to the same degree for the negatives? So like the negatives, here are the negative ones. Any thoughts? Why are the positive ones tripping this up but the negative ones are not as much? It's better at detecting uh, higher levels of the factor as opposed to lower levels. Uh, guess was detecting higher levels of the factor as, as opposed to lower. I would say not where I was going. The close. May, unless you mean what I think and what I'm thinking, which was not the words that I would pick. Let me go back to the loadings. Which items loaded highest? The negative ones did. Yeah. <coughs> The negative ones loaded the highest. So what this factor is, is more of the negative. So there's room for the positive ones to have more left over because it's not doing as good a job with those. The negative items are driving the factor at this point. Is that what you meant? Yep. Okay, that's what I thought. Cool. So this is diagnostic because this isn't just random offnesses, right? This is not a GPA of 3.0 made up of mostly Bs. If that were the case, all of these numbers would be off to some degree, but there'd be nothing that sticks out. No, this is like three A's and an F, essentially. Like, no, this is, this is constructive. All the items that are measured in the same way want to be more together. So this is the point where art and science have to kind of come together in terms of you troubleshooting this fit. It won't always be this clean. This makes for a nice example, but it doesn't always work this way. So what you would do as the analyst at this point is look back at the content of the items. And it is very much a post hoc kind of thing, like looking at what the items say, why is it that they want to be more together or less together? And you may stumble into, well, these both items focus on this one thing, or they both have a common stem, or they both refer to being a parent as opposed to an adult, or you know something that is driving this. So we would change the factor structure in accordance with this information to try to make it fit better. And that sort of crosses the line from what is traditionally confirmatory into what's a little bit exploratory. But it's not going back to EFA because we're still in charge of what the factor structure looks like. But at this point, if I were to modify the model, I should get another sample of item responses and see if my modified model fits that new sample. So replication is still really important anytime that you mess with the factor structure. Okay. How are we doing? Good. Good-ish. 
Now, wouldn't it be nice if you could be like, this is too much work. Can you just tell me how to fix it? Do you think that you could ask M plus or R to just tell you how to fix it? Yeah, you can. So, welcome to modification indices. I used to call these voodoo, but then someone told me that that is actually a religion in some cultures and that I could be accidentally offending people. So I've changed it to a different metaphor. It's, it's cheat codes. People who play video games. Anyone here play video games or have children that do? Or used to? People are nodding, a few, yeah? So like when my little brother bought his first Nintendo in like 1991 or whenever that was, he used to buy these little magazines that would tell him like where the extra hidden stuff was in Mario Brothers, like which block you could like jump with your head to make a mushroom come out and shit like that. And nowadays like there's, you know, the internet can tell you like all the cheat codes that people have figured out. Like if you go to Reddit, for instance, you can find all the, the things. That's what I think of as this. Like this has nothing to do with theory or principle. It's just straight up cheat codes. Modification indices is what they are called. Um, I had a student in uh, Germany this summer where I was teaching called the manipulation indices by mistake, and I thought that's actually a better name. So manipulation indices. We ask for these. So in the M plus output, there is a term called mod indices, and you can tell it what a minimum value is to print them. This is the minimum change to the chi-square from adding any one parameter to the model. And that value is the chi-square at 0 0.001 for an alpha. That's where I, that came from. So M plus is totally cool with giving you the cheat codes if you'd like. R is not only cool with it, it will ask you if it wants you to sort them in order of most to least useful. Super useful. Now, what do they mean? It says, like this one right here, you know, if you let the errors of item one and item three be correlated, that correlation would be this number out here in the last column, 0.827, and it would make your chi-square for how much worse you are than perfect go down by 143. So the first column is the change to the chi-square test statistic for how much worse you are than perfect. Unstandardized parameter is next, and then the last column is the standardized version. So what this is telling us is that items 1 and 3, the part that is not the factor that's left over, it wants to have a correlation between items of 0.8. And if I do that, I cut my test statistic almost in half. The same thing would happen if I let there be an extra correlation between not the factor parts of items 2 and 4, 2 and 6, and as well as several others to some extent. So it tells you what would happen. You don't even have to do it. It predicts that for you. Are these changes independent of each other? No. Okay. They are not. So if you make one, you get a whole new set of cheat codes based on that new model. So this is one thing that you have to be very careful about because it's very easy to blindly apply these additions and be like, look, it fits, cool. And then you'd be like, well, why do this two and four need an extra relationship? I don't know, but it fit. These have to be defendable. They have to be motivated by not just what the data say, but what the items actually are, what their content is. And ideally they would be both. But what they're picking up on though is this pattern of misfit. What's too high, what's too low? And error correlations is what it's suggesting because that's the only thing that it can suggest. The thing about the cheat codes is that it will never tell you when you need a new model. It can't, it's not that smart. All it will tell you is how to fix the model you have. So it's never gonna be like, you know what, you need surgery. It'll be like, you know what, I got some band-aids and some duct tape, and we're gonna make this work. So yes, be very careful with these things because they're not going to suggest what I actually end up doing next. 
My solution to this problem is not to add a bunch of error covariances that are basically band-aids to misfit. My solution is to change the model. If items 2, 4, and 6 all want to be together, let's make them their own factor. We'll have a factor that is positively worded situation forgiveness, and we'll have a separate one that's negatively worded. And that's not always going to be what would be a reasonable thing to do. That is purely with this example, given this pattern of offnesses. Lisa? Yes. But in that case, the model will, will be just identified, so... Nope. It will not. Why? So it would be just identified if I separately uh, okay. had a factor of three and then in a separate model a factor of three. Mm -hmm. But because I've got six, what I'm essentially going to do in fitting a two-factor model is add one new term. There's only one new parameter involved in making this a two-factor model. Do you know what it is? Covariance between the factors. Covariance. Between the factors. Covariance. Yep, yep, exactly, exactly. Because... Another way of thinking about the single factor model is as two factors that have a perfect correlation. So I'm just letting the correlation be something less than one by estimating it that way. So it's one new thing. Yeah, but if they were separate, you'd be right. And that, by the way, is in analyzing your homework data, why I said six items for one factor, or at least four for two, because then you're guaranteed to be over-identified. But that's not today. All right, so that's coming next week. Spoiler alert, it's going to work. But I say that to emphasize the decisions that I made versus what I would expect you to make when you're analyzing your own data. I would want you to react to the local misfit that you see and use your combination of judgment as a scientist in that content area and an analyst of quantitative methods to come up with something that's reasonable. All right. So voodoo, cheat code modification indices. They also tell you about local misfit, but they try to help you solve it. All right. 313, I think that call, we'll call it a day and a week. Any questions before we uh, adjourn? No. Have a good weekend. Yes, that is what I was going to say. How did you know? Have a good weekend, everybody. Uh, let's see. Formative assessment due on Monday, and I will see you next week. Let me know if you need anything. Thanks for playing.